should we get started? Magda, John, are you ready, guys? Um, yeah. It's 10 or 1, I think. People are still coming in. Could we wait a couple of more minutes? Let uh, John. John is out. Okay, yeah, she is. Okay, she's back. All right, let's get started then. <clears throat> Hello all, uh, good morning from Michigan, uh, greetings. Um, I'm pleased to welcome uh, all of you to the Zoominar on proteinopathies. Uh, we are lucky to have uh, two speakers today for the cancellation of one scheduled speaker. That's great, we are lucky. Um, today's speakers are Dr. Christian Griesinger and his postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Laif Anton Schmidt from the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry, Göttingen, Germany. So I have the pleasure to introduce both the speakers. Uh, here's a very brief introduction. Um, Christian has a very long uh, history of outstanding research and contributions to the field. Christian has received a PhD degree in chemistry working with Kessler at the University of Frankfurt, Germany, and postdoctoral research with Nobel art Richard Ernst at uh, ETH uh, Zurich. Then he joined the University of Frankfurt as a full professor of organic chemistry, that's interesting. Then about uh, nine to 10 years uh, after that, uh, he joined the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry as a director. Um, Christian is well known for the development of NMR spectroscopy and biomolecular applications. Uh, he's a world leader uh, in the NMR uh, field. He has received a number of awards and honors, uh, including the recent ones, uh, Gunther uh, Laukian Prize from ENC Conference and the Ampere Prize from Euromar. His current research includes NMR methods development, protein structure biology, signaling, and studio chemistry of natural products. And our second speaker, Dr. Leif Anton Schmidt, um, received master's degree in chemistry from the University of Göttingen, uh, and then PhD in structural biology, working with uh, Professor Christian Grisinger uh, at the Max Planck Institute, but the degree is received at the University of Göttingen. Now he's working as a research associate, associate or postdoctoral fellow at the Max Planck Institute. His research focuses on amyloid aggregation of alpha synuclein at the membrane interface. So with that, I would, it's my pleasure to welcome both of you and the virtual floor is yours. Take it away. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction and of course also for the invitation uh, to this um, uh, to present here today um, and this is a, a double feature and so we are uh, using the same presentation so let's see how well this goes uh, uh, so the title is interference with protein aggregation at the membrane such a biology and and therapy and uh, so this is shared between uh, life and, um, and myself. Uh, this is the place where both of us are working in the NMR building uh, here uh, in the NMR based structural biology um, uh, department of NMR based structural biology. Now, uh, this is a view into the, the hall where, as every NMR spectroscopist, uh, tries to collect um, as many NMR spectrometers <clears throat> as possible. Uh, the highest field has been 950, but recently we got a 1.2 gigahertz instrument, which was delivered in July. Uh, then it was actually on field, but lost its field about 10 weeks ago or so. And here you see the nice uh, fog created by the uh, whatever thousand liters or helium or helium or so evaporating from the magnet. But uh, as you can see now, uh, this is a picture actually uh, from today where Supriya so Pratia is measuring on the on the spectrometer. It's working now um, very well, and we hope um, that it cannot, it will not be, um, uh, it will not quench uh, quench again. Um, so, uh, of course, the the field of aggregation, uh, aggregating proteins, has been mentioned in many many talks. Uh, just to remind you that there's prion protein for creutzfeldt jakob disease, alpha nuclein related to Parkinson's disease and multisystem atrophy, uh, Alzheimer's disease where a beta and tau aggregate, and type 2 diabetes, which is maybe not so much in neurodegeneration, 
uh, but rather uh, pancreas degeneration, but due to the fact that our host Rams is very much interested in it, um, in this disease, it's of course also featured here. In most of these diseases, um, uh, intrinsically disordered proteins uh, as in a monomeric state uh, can be represented um, by ensembles, and here one sees alpha nuclein monomer as well as um, uh, tau monomer. And uh, this uh, ensemble description has been uh, worked out at the time uh, in collaboration with uh, Markus Zweckstetter. Um, then here we have the intermediate, the oligomer, which finally um, aggregates to fibrils. Uh, um, here a structure of uh, Chetrinstra, uh, of alpha nuclein. Um, and here of uh, tau neurofibular tangles uh, uh, solved by CRIOM from Alzheimer patients by Michael Gödert about three years um, ago. In, in this case here, in the alpha nuclein case, about 50% uh, of the protein participates in the fibril formation. In the case of tau, it's about 20%. Uh, now, um, uh, in 2009, we were interested again in collaboration with Markus Speckstetter in finding out whether um, fibrils or oligomers are more toxic and um, introduced for that uh, three proteins which uh, disallow the formation of these fibrils. And then we saw indeed that in various animal models, here just the elegance is shown, that the uh, mutation which prevented the formation of the fibrils was more toxic uh, than the the one that formed the fibrils, indicating that uh, one should focus actually on oligomers <clears throat> because they can convey toxicity um, already. And of course, uh, then blocking uh, this uh, uh, formation of these toxic oligomers uh, uh, and in turn then also uh, um, with, with the same tools, also the fibrils, because the oligomers are on the way to the fibrils, uh, there should be, uh, it should be possible then to develop treatment, so to protect neurons from, uh, from, from uh, dying and also maybe restoration um, of, uh, of function. And a lot of approaches have been um, uh, undertaken uh, in, the, in the past, for example, um, with, with antibodies, but also with vaccination. Now, um, they have not been super um, successful until, um, uh, until this day, more or less. For example, the most recent one, Biogen ASI, they halted a phase three uh, trial on aducanumab in March 2019. Uh, then, by interpreting uh, data um, uh, of a high of the highest dose, uh, they announced then in 2019 that they would apply to the FDA for market entry early 2020. Then they postponed it. And I just uh, read yesterday that on November 6, actually an advisory committee to the FDA did not recommend aducanumab to be introduced to the market. Now, this is in principle a little bit uh, along the lines that what Denis Selko uh, said, uh, uh, commenting actually on uh, this uh, um, history that the key form of amyloids, the soluble A-beta oligomers, are not uh, uh, targeted uh, um, efficiently enough, and these are the smoking guns in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and I would like to uh, convince you that indeed oligomers might be this general smoking gun in uh, neuro neurodegeneration. So, uh, and actually also on uh, Parkinson's disease, um, a similar uh, development uh, can be observed here with this antibody Prazinezumab, uh, which was um, uh, stopped actually in April 2020, when also the primary endpoint in the clinical trial was not uh, reached. So um, we try to uh, work with small molecules and uh, be because they do not have the delivery problems uh, that, uh, that antibodies of course have, especially when they have to cross the blood-brain barrier and also go then intracellularly for, uh, since most of the aggregates which, uh, which um, are related to the diseases are actually um, intracellular. And, and um, uh, the... Uh, so, so for that, we developed this uh, molecule under to db which I will show you in a little bit larger uh, on the next um, slides. This was developed uh, um, in collaboration with um, Armin Giese from, from the Ludwig Maximilians University, who, when he was here um, in, in Göttingen, together with um, Manfred Eigen, developed a, a screen that allows to look for... Um, uh, for for um, or to distinguish monomers from from oligomers, 
uh, by virtue of, of dice which are attached to the to the monomer and then in principle one just counts uh, the number of uh, um, the number of red and, and green dice and plots that uh, so the number uh, of these dice is actually uh, is, is plotted then as the distance from the from the origin so um, if one has no inhibitor then one sees here um, monomers and and oligomers uh, according to the distance here from the uh, from the from the origin origin uh, while with inhibitor one hopes then to reduce the number of these uh, yellow spots away from the um, origin and with that actually um, uh, out of three scaffolds uh, Amigisa found this diphenylpyrazole compound uh, which uh, we then uh, developed uh, in principle blindly very embarrassingly for a structural biologist but in the absence of any um, uh, target uh, any structure um, for an oligomer um, um, it has to be blind and life will convince you that we are not totally blind uh, uh, anymore but are uh, gaining some insight into into these structures so this molecule as you can see here um, inhibited then in this um, uh, fluorescence assay uh, to about 77 percent the aggregation and uh, of, of alphanuclein and about 84% um, here for the prion protein. It was very surprising then to see in collaboration with Antoinette Kilian that also the aggregation of IPP uh, uh, was um, inhibited uh, even by substoichiometric amounts of under 38 b here we have two micromolar compared to five micromolar of um, IPP. Now, um, the molecule is very lipophilic, and uh, that's actually the reason why then we, we, we have to work with, with membranes. Uh, the solubility is only 0.2 micromolar in water, but beyond two, two, uh, 10 millimolar um, in lipids. Uh, this also is the reason why uh, the um, concentration that one can reach um, in the brain, for example, of a mouse is pretty high, 60 micromolar or so uh, can be easily reached in the brain and uh, in the pancreas which of course for diabetes is more important um, it's about sorry for the cutting here it's about uh, 30 micromolar so about half of the uh, of the concentration here now um, molecules which um, are known from traditional um, um, medicals like curcumin or also egcg um, uh, reach concentrations only uh, about a factor of 10,000 lower in the brain and you see here, for example, um, uh, with the eyes of a chemist, that there's uh, quite some um, a resemblance uh, of, the, of the structures. It's just that the biophysical properties uh, of curcumin and similarly also of EGCG are such that they do not make it in sufficient concentration to the brain. And this actually could be even seen now in patients. Uh, Johannes Levin has uh, published last year in Lancet Neurology a study in which EGCG up to the concentration that almost did not almost damage the liver uh, was applied for um, about a year or so and there was no disease modifying um, effect although EGCG is super potent in order to uh, prevent aggregation of uh, um, any um, aggregating protein be it a beta be it tau be it uh, be it um, uh, uh, IAPP um, or alpha synuclein so this is actually the reason then uh, this uh, lipophilicity which um, allows the um, uh, uh, transgression or permeability of the bl uh, blood-brain uh, barrier or leads to this permeability um, and then also um, um, that it is important to study the aggregation process uh, uh, from monomers to oligomers to fibrils um, on, the, uh, on, the, on the membrane. Now, why would we be interested in ALA 38 b Well, um, the interest comes only from the fact that we see uh, a quite nice efficacy in, uh, in animal models. And uh, one of them here, this is an A30P, uh, uh, which is a human variant of um, alpha nuclein overexpression model in, uh, in mouse, uh, where one uh, um, sees that uh, treatment actually um, uh, leads to um, less aggregation, these brown spots here actually are the aggregates uh, of alpha nuclein, while here in the treated ones there are less of those, and uh, there's about a 10-week extension of disease-free survival of these mice. Disease-free means that they still uh, stay on a rotating rod for some um, time. And 
um, um, looking at this uh, um, e effect, which I just showed you so far about uh, physics um, uh, in vitro, uh, that uh, these oligomers are blocked in their formation. Uh, this can be seen here. Um, when we use unlearn 38 b then in ultra centrifugation, we see only uh, the light fractions of um, alpha nuclein here in, uh, in fraction one and two. While if one um, actually compares this with this vehicle, then one sees these light fractions. But in addition, uh, um, another uh, peak here, which we attribute to the oligomers. And we can actually uh, repeat this experiment in vitro and then see in the monomer, indeed, we see just fraction one and two, uh, while the oligomer actually has also something here in fraction three and four. Uh, of course, this is by no means saying that these are exactly the identical species. Uh, so we um, collaborated with um, Maria Grazia Spilantini and Uri Ascheri on a model um, uh, which is a truncation variant of um, alpha nuclein, uh, untreated or treated. And again, there one sees uh, quite nicely that the um, amount of um, aggregates, which is shown here, uh, for example, or smaller aggregates, is reduced if one goes from the placebo to the uh, to the um, um, treated um, one. And um, uh, these little dots here, according to Uri Ascheri, are monomers and dimers. So uh, again, a depletion of the uh, oligomeric state. So the removal of the toxic oligomer seems to be a mechanism of these diphenylpyrazole compounds. Now, um, we have done this on many, many models, uh, uh, five Parkinson's disease models also, um, a, sp a spreading model um, in, in mice as well as in, in, in macaques. Uh, I mentioned this uh, uh, Spilantini uh, model where we also observed refunctionalization of dopaminal neurons. We see a similar effect in a beta mice um, um, as well as in tau mice. And uh, I, I, I would just like to, oh, sorry, and I didn't mention the um, Type 2 diabetes, where glucose and also long term glucose levels are actually uh, normalized. And I will talk a little bit also about the MSA models. Now, this is this late uh, stage uh, tau mouse model in which um, human tau is overexpressed, which leads between month six and 15 to tau tangle formation. We treat it from month 14.5 to 17.5. And uh, then um, our collaborators uh, uh, here, Brendel, measured uh, with FDG PET uh, the uh, glucose consumption in mouse brain. And uh, one sees that uh, uh, compared to the um, previous, I mean, to, compared to the start of the treatment, uh, so at 14.5 versus 17.5, that uh, vehicle mice actually uh, have, a, uh, have less uh, glucose consumption. The treated, uh, unlike the treated mice, have more uh, glucose consumption, while the non-carrier is actually um, still the same. And this is true not only for frontal cortex, but also for the for the hippocampus. So we can say that the decline of metabolism for the vehicle group in this model uh, um, um, is observed with FGG PET, uh, while we see an improvement for the treated group. Now, um, coming back to MSA, I mentioned already uh, the um, Parkinson um, mice, where we, we saw um, a beneficial effect. We see this here also, the TH uh, uh, positive neurons, uh, uh, wild type count and uh, transgenes treated uh, um, have more or less the same neuron count, while the uh, transgene untreated um, has less. And if one compares here um, the challenging beam, uh, a test result, then also wild type mice and the treated transgenes have the same uh, um, behavior, uh, while the number of slips per step in the transgene that is not treated um, is uh, significantly larger. So there's not only this neuronal protection, but also um, a phenotypic um, effect. Now, um, I show MSA next to PD because uh, the the, the, the fibrils, um, um, at least in humans, of course, nobody knows whether it's true in mice, but potentially it is. Uh, both are um, uh, beneficially influenced by the treatment of unlearned 38B. Um, and this just shows here um, data from Claudio Soto, um, in which he um, mentions the difference uh, between MSA-derived fibrils and uh, Parkinson-patient-derived uh, uh, fibrils. 
again, I should mention, I'm, I'm, I'm not claiming that the MSA and PD fibrils in the mice are identical to the ones in, in human, but it could be. Uh, and also, uh, Markus Zweckstetter um, has published um, uh, the, the comparison here in which he sees that the PD-derived fibrils and the MSA-derived fibrils at least uh, sometimes um, um, uh, disagree um, in structure. And uh, um, I think still it's remarkable that both diseases are um, beneficially affected by the treatment with under 38B. Now, I mentioned already the interaction with membranes and uh, um, there's this, uh, um, in a way, unifying mechanism, which is certainly not our invention. Um, um, Arispe and Pollard and especially then Ratnesh Lal have uh, uh, looked at pore formation in, um, uh, in black lipid membranes. Um, and uh, this is exactly what one sees here. Roland Benz has recorded this. Um, this here is an AFM image of the, um, of, of the oligomer on, uh, on the membrane. And if one puts under 38 b into the membrane, I mentioned it's it can be dissolved to about 10 millimolar concentration. Um, then um, there's uh, um, uh, a pore formation, which then is blocked after about one minute. And um, in collaboration with Ratnesh Lal, uh, we saw a similar effect on a beta. Uh, also here we see pore formation up to a current of several nano pairs. Uh, while here, um, if one has the under 38 b in the membrane, uh, we see that um, the uh, conductivity is limited to about 30 picoampere pairs. Um, also with tau, these are measurements that again Roland Benz did. Um, after about 30 minutes or so, the um, conductivity is reduced. Um, and similarly with um, uh, IPP, uh, um, uh, this is now a measurement of dye leakage. One sees that five micromolar IPP uh, can be blocked with two micromolar under 38B. So um, uh, neurodegenerative diseases could be channelopathies. Um, this is um, a term that Ratnesh also likes um, um, very much. At least it could contribute in, in one fashion to the, or in one way uh, to, the, to, the, to the disease. Uh, pore formation could happen uh, and also at, uh, for, for, at mitochondria and, and impair their function, ER, stress, Golgi uh, function. And of course, seeding and transmission, I did not really mention, but uh, we had at least two uh, or three models, I think, in which um, this was also um, impaired. And of course, we are now interested very much in understanding how these um, um, aggregates on the membrane um, make pores and can be uh, blocked. And that's why life now takes over to describe a little bit the structure biology of this aggregation uh, on the membrane. Please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I will uh, start talking about um, the aggregation of alpha-synuclein. And um, yeah, I will go a little bit into the specifics of alpha-synuclein aggregation. And as Professor Griesing already pointed out, we have a monomer um, of alpha-synuclein which, which associates and misfolds and then restructures and elongates to eventually form fibrils. Um, the monomeric form of alpha-synuclein bears a strong affinity to negatively charged um, phospholipid membranes adopting a dynamic uh, conformation uh, which is helical uh, for the residues uh, 1 to 100 and uh, disordered for residues um, uh, 100 to 140. Um, this membrane binding propensity uh, and, and this helical conformation seems to be retained for at least a part of the N-terminus uh, once um, oligomers are formed, um, while the so-called NAC region um, uh, form, starts to form uh, beta sheets and uh, these can insert into uh, uh, membranes as sh shown by uh, the late Chris Dobson and his co-workers. Um, in recent years, we have learned um, uh, more about fibril structures um, thanks to advances by solid state and MR and cryo EM. And uh, we have, uh, um, sorry, yeah. we ha uh, there were um, two main global folds uh, that have been identified. Um, the polymorph one with its uh, Greek key shape or a triple A uh, form motif, and the inherently different um, folded, differently folded polymorph two, which um, also features part of the uh, N-terminus uh, um, attached uh, to the outside of the fibril core. 
Um, all of these studies, especially those for aggregates, have been, in, uh, have been conducted in the absence of phospholipids. Um, but since we are interested in uh, very lipophilic uh, compounds, we need to do so, uh, we need to study this aggregation in the presence of lipids. And um, I will uh, tell you what we've learned um, in the process. Um, we started with um, looking at the kinetics of the process and for doing so we used solution state NMR um, to track monomer consumption and thioflavin T fluorescence to uh, track fibro formation. And in solution state NMR, um, we leveraged the effect that uh, once alpha-synuclein monomers um, uh, aggregate, they become too large to be detected since they tumble very slowly and relax strongly, and therefore signal decreases. And uh, thioflavin T is um, sensitive to cross beta sheet uh, uh, structures and fibrils. And what we saw is that we uh, have a, um, a sharp decrease uh, in uh, monomers uh, followed um, by a sharp increase of fibrils. And what we realized that, uh, is that the, uh, the, fibr the fibril formation is slightly delayed. And when we look at the difference of the two curves, we see that we have. Um, uh, a population of something that's, that exca escapes both a solution state and MR, um, as well as thioflavin T fluorescence, although this curve might not be um, uh, quantitative, uh, we were still interested in uh, what we're looking at, at uh, in detail. And um, uh, therefore, we use st uh, solid state NMR to characterize the aggregates and uh, to make things easy, we'll start with the fibrils. Um, we uh, acquired uh, a, s a significant amount of spectra amongst those um, uh, sequence assignment spectra, and we were able to assign um, residues 38 to 95 uh, in the fibrils. And uh, from this, we could look at the, the secondary structure. And what we saw is that we have extended beta sheets um, interrupted at position 45 and 46, 59 and 60. 73 and 74 and 80 and 81. Um, when we took our chemical shift data and compared it to, um, to the data uh, published for Polymorph 2 by um, the groups of Bert Meyer and Henning Stahlberg, uh, we realized that there are um, significant similarities while there are also uh, significant differences. And uh, uh, we can look at these similarities and differences in detail and uh, what we found is that um, residues 40 to about 56, as well as 70 to about 78, seem uh, to be very comparable, um, uh, meaning that the structure is, uh, is very comparable, while at the same time, residues 57 to about 69 and 80 to 95 seem to, um, to adopt a more a different um, uh, chemical shift, uh, meaning a different structure. Um, to have, however, um, uh, confirm the general fold um, of, uh, of the alpha-synuclein molecules within the fibro, uh, we uh, performed carbon-carbon correlation spectra with long DAR mixing. And um, this was done by uh, Rinda Sant, who is a PhD student and our um, a visiting PhD student in our department. And um, uh, she got a, a, a set of um, through space contacts for uh, the um, for the fibrils, and a couple of those, uh, which I highlight here in green, um, uh, actually confirm uh, the, uh, the the global fold of the alpha synuclein uh, molecule. Um, uh, on top of this, which was uh, which we found interesting, is that we did not observe an, an expected contact for isoleucine eighty eight to asparagine sixty five. Um, leading us to um, uh, the, the suspicion that this uh, seam C-terminal part of the fibro might be frame shifted into this direction uh, slightly. Uh, once we knew the, the fibril structure, uh, we wanted to know how these fibrils interact with uh, phospholipids. And for this purpose, we um, acquired three-dimensional HH and H spectra and what, what these um, spectra allow us is that uh, if we um, get polarization on a, a mo mobile molecule um, such as water, we can transfer the por polarization from a proton to another proton um, uh, through NOE mixing. And um, by this, we can identify 
several NHs in the uh, protein backbone which are in contact with uh, such mobile species such, uh, such as water and uh, of course also other mobile species uh, such as uh, phospholipids uh, where we can see the CH2 groups for example. Um, the results of this uh, you can see here and uh, we were able to identify two main lipid binding domains in the alpha synuclein fibrils um, uh, for uh, the first one being uh, residues 39 to about 46 um, and uh, the second one being uh, from residues 85 to about 95. Um, interestingly, we were also able to, uh, uh, to identify uh, at least two contacts to um, the choline CH3 group of uh, fossil choline. Um, and uh, what we think this means is um, that this part of the fibril is actually inserted into the uh, lipid bilayer uh, a little bit more deeply so that it's uh, that these residues can actually be in contact uh, with the, the, the lipid head groups. Now this is uh, this has been all a long um, lead-in uh, for what I actually want to tell you. Um, so we looked at the uh, the aggregation process and uh, all of the species that we could isolate. Uh, we start off here with the monomer and uh, we recorded carbon-carbon uh, correlation spectra for these uh, monomers and what we see is that we have um, uh, predominantly uh, chemical uh, shifts that, that uh, are indicative of helical uh, conformations and uh, we also observe uh, isoleucine 88 and uh, this is in line with uh, residues 1 to 100 um, adopting a helical conformation when bound to the fossil lipids uh, something that we could also confirm with solution state NMR. And uh, then uh, secondly, we can look at the fibrils. The spectrum you have seen already in an expanded fashion, but um, I want to highlight here um, two peaks actually, um, which uh, are, uh, in, uh, are indicative of a helical conformation. And they're very similar to what we observe in, um, in the monomer. And uh, what we think is happening here is um, that we have uh, actually an uh, N-terminal helix um, on the fibril, which, uh, which is um, bound to the phospholipid membrane, at least the part that is still bound to the membrane. Um, this has been hypothesized uh, by a couple of groups um, due to the fact that um, uh, the, even the fibril strongly bind uh, to phospholipids. When we then uh, then let the monomer aggregate just the right amount, um, we get uh, what we call the so-called intermediate one. Uh, what's special about this intermediate one is that um, there are a couple of chemical shifts which are very similar to what we observe in fibrils, uh, for example, for this valine 74 or threonine 59. Um, when we look at this schematic, you see um, the, what this structurally might mean. Um, uh, so we have residues 38 to 42, um, which, uh, or actually 45 even, um, uh, which adopts a uh, fibrolite conformation. The same can be said for a loop uh, around uh, residue 90, 59, as well as a loop region from 72 to um, 80, uh, which adopt this early conformation, while um, at the same time, there a significant, there's a significant amount of chemical shifts, such as here, here, here or here, uh, which are not uh, uh, like the fibril. So we do actually have a, a, a structurally distinct species here. Um, at the same time, you also observe this N-terminal helix, um, which assures membrane binding of the species apparently. And um, when this, uh, this uh, species then further aggregates, um, we uh, observe um, chemical shifts that are very similar um, to uh, the fibril um, with uh, a couple of exceptions. So um, residues 38 to 80 um, appear to adopt the, the fibril conformation while residues 80 to 95 or 81 to 95 um, do not. And uh, we, uh, we're currently not, uh, not sure what these residues do, but the, the incorporation into the fibrils um, seems to be delayed. Um, uh, I want to mention here as a side note uh, that the bulk of our, uh, our um, spectra has been uh, acquired at um, 
uh, at 850 and 800 megahertz, a couple also at 950 megahertz. And um, with the current 1.2 gigahertz magnet, um, we hope to um, get even deeper insight into the problems that we're looking at. Um, Lauren Andreas and Kumar Tikvani uh, Mulian um, already showed on M2 that the sensitivity um, of uh, the magnet is about uh, twofold, as can, see, can be seen by noise here, and as well, uh, the line width is um, reduced by about uh, twenty uh, percent and more. So um, we're very, very um, positive when it comes to this magnet that that it will help us identify even uh, even more um, uh, uh, specificities of the, of the process. Um, I want to go back to uh, to the uh, to this intermediate two uh, for uh, for a bit. Uh, so I told you that residues 80 or 81 to 95 are delayed in their incorporation uh, into the into the fiber core, and uh, we think that this is um, happening because of lipid interaction, um, because in the the fibrils, uh, residues 85 to 95 um, are in uh, in contact with lipids. And we think that this is a remnant of um, the, uh, the, the contact it's in, in the uh, intermediates. Um, this would also rationalize a couple of um, chemical shift differences, which we see in the fibril cores, since exactly this uh, region is the one that is uh, structurally different from the, fib uh, the similar fibrils uh, grown in the absence of uh, um, phospholipids. Um, finally, we also characterize the intermediates regarding their um, chronological occurrence in the, uh, in the aggregation process. And uh, what we found is that intermediate one seems to be um, positioned right at the end of the lag phase, uh, while intermediate two is positioned uh, at or up, um, uh, at the after the, the uh, end of the lag phase, meaning that starting from here, we have strong uh, aggregation. I, of course, also want to mention that this is by no means the complete um, aggregation mechanism, and there's still uh, a couple of uh, species which we're uh, likely to miss uh, just yet. And um, of course, the segmental process that we see here that um, first uh, one part forms, then the, uh, this one restructures, and then another one uh, gets incorporated, um, lays near that there might even be uh, further uh, uh, further fibro forms uh, that uh, that results from this segmental process, and this has also been shown that uh, that fibrils um, can even mature further. Um, finally, we're also interested in the interaction of uh, under 130 B with um, with uh, um, you know, with these species, and for this we teamed up with uh, Riza de Verzoglu and uh, Lauren Andreas, and uh, they have been uh, involved in all the solid state NMR experiments. And what they did is they used uh, a, a dynamic nuclear polarization setup. And what we do here is that um, we have a biradical and attached to the, NM uh, the traditional NMR magnet, we have a gyrotron. And from this gyrotron via transmission line, we get uh, microwaves, which excite the electrons of this, uh, this radical. And if we have a traditional carbon-carbon um, uh, correlation uh, uh, experiment, for example, we can use the polarization that we get on this electron, transfer it to a proton, and um, then to a carbon, and then further, and uh, uh, thus enhancing the signal that we get from these experiments. Um, one of the caveats, however, uh, so far, is that we have to um, record these, uh, these experiments at 100 Kelvin. And uh, this means that all of the conformations of the protein are uh, frozen out, uh, leading to significant line broadening uh, of uh, all signals. Um, however, most of the, uh, the signals can uh, be observed as they uh, are at room temperature. Um, on top of this, we get a, a significant um, enhancement of about six to seven fold of our signal, uh, giving us the chance to uh, detect um, uh, protein molecule uh, interactions. Um, what we did is um, under these DNP conditions, we performed 15 N13C TDOR experiments, and these allow us to uh, transfer magnetization from 15 N213C through space, 
and uh, we used um, 15 n labeled alpha synuclein in the presence of 13 c labeled under 138 b which is labeled in these two positions here and uh, we could actually see um, a transfer of magnetization from the backbone to um, uh, the compound carbon signals and um, uh, this confirms uh, backbone binding of uh, under 130 b to the alpha synuclein uh, aggregates um, something that had already been been studied uh, in simulation by Dirk Mattis on uh, proteins of other um, uh, other uh, IDPs um, of, of oligomers of other IDPs um, uh, very much in line with the uh, uh, with the results that we also see in vivo that under 130 B seems to have efficacy in more than just one um, uh, proteinopathy. Um, on top of this, we also performed NHHC experiments, and for these, we reversed the labeling, and now we have 15N labeling on under 130B and 13C labeling on the, the, the protein. And what we saw here is transfer, so NHHC again, uh, more or less um, gives us the, the possibility to transfer magnetization from 15N to uh, 13C. And what we see here is a transfer from under 130B to um, both uh, oligomers and fibrils. Uh, we're not exactly sure what this interaction looks like, um, but what we can say for now is that the, the, the interaction is distinct, which is an uh, interesting finding in itself, uh, which I think. And um, with this, I'd like to conclude and uh, hand over to Christian Giesinger again. Uh, so um, uh, what what we we have uh, the two of us <laughs> have openly shown to you is uh, that that new protection is reached with under 38 b potentially even in a strain independent manner. Uh, uh, um, it will be interesting to see whether this is also true for other diseases, uh, for example tau dependent and so on. Potential mechanism could be detoxification of oligomers on the membrane. Uh, Life just showed you the interaction of under 3 b with membrane embedded um, oligomers and, and, and fibrils. And of course, we are very much, and, and he showed uh, structural utilization of intermediates on the membrane. And, and hopefully, um, in some months or years or so, hopefully not years, uh, we will also be able to tell a little bit more on, on where this small molecule actually binds. Uh, finally, um, uh, uh, we, we have finished uh, phase one successfully in uh, August uh, 20 for this molecule. Actually, not we, but uh, the company Modak, which we founded uh, based on, on this technology together with Armin Giese and further uh, people. And the phase two is planned for 2021. Now, uh, this is a kind of the hope slide. Uh, normally, motor function in Parkinson's disease and similarly, um, phenotype or memory in Alzheimer and, and so on is, is declining while cells are dying. In the case of um, Parkinson's disease, about 70% of the dopaminergic of the dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra are gone when the disease is um, is diagnosed. Uh, then dopaminergic uh, therapy uh, kicks in, but when the um, neuronal substrate is is gone, then dyskinesias um, start, and uh, the treatment um, is not possible anymore. So if one could delay uh, the decline of the neurons. Um, uh, just maybe by a factor of two or so, one could probably extend the uh, um, um, kind of good life uh, of Parkinson patients uh, quite a bit. And of course, um, especially in Parkinson's disease, there are um, three risk factors which um, lead uh, to its occurrence about, uh, about 10 years later or so, anosmia, REM sleep disturbance and obstipation. So if one uh, had a positive effect, uh, of such a delaying molecule one could treat early and by that maybe prevent totally the uh, uh, necessity for um, uh, uh, symptomatic um, treatment. Um, and similar um, it could also happen with Alzheimer's disease and maybe also with type 2 diabetes where of course the um, diagnos diagnostic tools are much better evolved, evolved uh, than in the case of, um, of uh, Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease. So with that, I would like to close. I mean, um, uh, life uh, is already uh, here, of course. He, he gave uh, a part of the talk. Um, Claudio Fernandez um, started the project here uh, about uh, 17 years um, ago, uh, now a group leader. 
uh, and director of an, uh, of a, of an institute in, um, in, uh, in Rosario, Argentina. Um, I should mention the collaboration with Markus Zweckstetter, um, um, a, long, uh, a long time of the project. Uh, then, um, of course, um, many thanks to the uh, two chemists, Sergei Rasanov <coughs> and Andrei Leonov, who made uh, probably in the meantime about a thousand compounds or so, which are derivatives of this um, uh, diphenylpyrazole. Then, of course, Loren Andreas and Risa Dervisoglu were mentioned already for the collaboration on solid state and especially also on DNP. Stefan Becker and Karin Giller always providing us with the uh, with um, uh, with the proteins that life especially needs uh, and puts in the in the rotors, then a lot of collaborations on animal models. But especially, I would like to uh, mention the collaboration uh, now over uh, 15 years with Armin Giese, um, with whom also this company Monarch was found founded, and Roland Benz for the electrophysiology, and then also special thanks to. Um, Antoinette Kilian and Jo Höppner for the IPP um, stuff I just mentioned in passing, Ratnesh Lal also for being such a nice host to live uh, during his uh, six months stay or so at his lab. Erwan Bizar and Maria Grazia Spinantini for um, two mouse models and uh, Uri Ascheri for measuring the storm images I was showing uh, on the model that Maria Grazia developed. So thank you very much. Thank you both for the great presentations. Really appreciate it. Um, let's see the Q and A session. Let me start with one um, for life. You showed the fiber structure when it's bound to membrane using carbon-carbon yes. dot experiment. You did not see the signals for the N-terminus, even though it's helically structured. Is that correct? Um, uh, we did. Or what, what? What exactly do you mean by not see the signals? Because you showed like uh, peaks from 35 to... Oh, um, uh, no, they, those signals apparently were um, too weak to be detected in these kinds of experiments. So um, this is in a different magnet with a different rotor. No, no, I'm talking about the beginning spectrum where you showed the first carbon-carbon 2D spectrum. You were, uh, you were mentioning oh. that you were only seeing that one. Oh, um, there, there, there are here and here. So you see your entire end terminus? Yes. Um, so very weakly so, but right here. I'm sorry. Is it helical structure or beta shade? Uh, that is helical. That is helical. Okay. Yeah, they're very weak signals. Um, okay. So they're an indication, uh, but uh, we do observe them. Yes. So why why are the weak? Is it dynamic or? Um, well, uh, so the way I see it is we have vesicles in here. Yeah. And a, uh, a fibril is a very long structure. So um, only part of this very long structure is actually bound still to vesicles. Um, and therefore, therefore, that part is, is showing these N-terminal hel helices um, uh, rather than the full, uh, full structure. Because once there is no membrane to be bound uh, to, uh, then this helix uh, apparently disappears. So it's only a, f a minor fraction of the fibrils which are, uh, show this, this, this interaction. So what kind of lipids did you use here? And is it lipid dependent? Um, th that we did not probe. We stuck with what we started with, which is um, uh, POPA and POPC. Um, I do not expect a major difference, um, but uh, of course, there is always the possibility. Yeah. Well, studies have shown that it's uh, charge, charge interaction plays a big role. And yes. then raft also plays a role as well. Okay. Yes. So we have a question from Bin. Go ahead. You have, you should be able to ask question directly. Hi, a very exciting talk and the finding about the small molecule inhibitor. I have two questions uh, for Dr. Grazinger. So one is about the mechanism. The other is about the, its in vivo efficacy. So about the mechanisms you mentioned, uh, that small molecule you discover is stabilized the non-toxic oligomer. Uh, what are the ag evidences and also how do you distinguish between non-toxic oligomer versus toxic oligomer? The second question I have is about the uh, in vivo efficacy. So you mentioned it can, it's a BBB permeable, it, uh, much better than uh, curcumin and EGCG. 
uh, how, uh, what's the delivery route? Do you, uh, you know, does it go through diet, like by eating or, or by injection into the vein or directly inject into the brain? And for this uh, in vivo study, do you see any, you know, the, like uh, uh, for like h mice, whether you see any uh, mem uh, memory improvement, those like a behavior tests? Thank you. Okay, okay uh, maybe let, let me start with, with the last one and, and please uh, speak up again if I am not answering everything uh, because I, I should start eating on lunch with ALB and cannot remember everything. <laughs> So uh, the delivery route is, is oral. Uh, so in, in, in mice, uh, it's very handy that we can just grind it into dry food. Um, and that's why it's also most possible to um, apply it to so many mouse models all over the world, uh, because we just have to send the food without and with the under 38B. Um, and, and then um, um, it can just be um, applied in the, in, the, in the mouse house. Uh, for human application, we have a... Um, we have a, a formulation uh, which is also oral, um, so the, um, uh, the, the, um, the, the, it is taken up from the gut to the, to the blood and then it goes from the blood to the brain. The brain concentration is normally five to ten times higher than the blood concentration, which mm -hmm. is the lipophilicity of the, of the compound. So um, actually the, it's, it's not really a blood-brain barrier, but it's rather like a vacuum cleaner, um, so it's actually as I say, the concentration is higher. Um, actually, also there, there is um, a question by Gabor Natch saying, by any chance, is it known why FDA rejected under 3 dp uh, FDA has not never um, um, has not rejected under 3 dp It has rejected aducanumab, and it was not FDA, but an advisory committee to FDA, just to make make that uh, that that clear. Now, the other question was on. Um, the evidence uh, regarding toxic and non-toxic oligomers. Um, I think you win a Nobel Prize if you can show that in vivo, uh, uh, which, um, which uh, oligomer is toxic and which one is not. Uh, so the, um, what, what we see is that, uh, um, I mentioned that uh, in, in two evidences uh, from this A30P model, uh, that uh, with ultra centrifugation and uh, Western plotting then, it was possible to show that um, larger oligomers, this fraction three and four, was depleted. Uh, and so um, uh, the amount of these oligomers was, was reduced. Uh, the, uh, in, this, in the same manner also in this um, uh, mouse model <coughs> that Maria Grazia Spinantini developed, the MI2 model, we, we see the similar effect. Um, I think it's a correlation uh, to assume that uh, um, depletion of these oligomers, which in the absence of treatment are observed, uh, um, uh, um, can be correlated with the beneficial effect in these, in these models. Um, I mean, of course, this follows the idea that uh, oligomers are toxic, and so we see them uh, uh, in the ultracentrifugation, we see them in the, uh, in the storm images and they are reduced in both cases under the treatment and in these treated mice one sees a beneficial effect. So that, that's more or less the only evidence uh, we have. Of course, we have also the in vitro evidence that there this molecule also depletes the oligomers. Um, and uh, um, uh, we had this um, um, model uh, with, uh, together with Markus uh, with the triple P where oligomers actually were um, increased in concentration because the escape to the fibrils was no longer there and the toxicity also went, went up. Then there was a question regarding um, phenotype, uh, for example, memory improvement. Um, yes, uh, this, this was observed in, a, in, the, um, in, in this a beta um, model um, in which uh, APPPS1, um, this APPPS1 uh, model, there was an improvement um, in, in memory, uh, both in applica application, uh, exactly this one here. Uh, this is uh, published here in Embo Molecular Medicine in 2018, uh, where um, treatment between months two and six led to memory improvement compared to the untreated mice. And um, if we treat it between six and 10, uh, then, um, I mean, after six months, the memory was down to about 20% or so, if one tries to quantify it. 
and then after 10 months it improved actually back to about 60 percent or so um, it, it, when we looked at um, uh, um, now uh, long-term potentiation lpt long ltp long-term potentiation we even saw that um, it was fully recovered to 100 percent so um, there were also inflammatory processes then in this um, APPPS1 um, uh, mouse model, which potentially um, um, led to this um, slightly different enhancement of phenotype between memory and, um, and LTP. Uh, we saw improvement also, as I should mention that in this APPPS1 model, there's little neurodegeneration. So we think that the neurons are still kind of alive, but dysfunctional. And then uh, by the application of the molecule are refunctionalized. We see a similar effect in the um, MI2 model from Maria Grazia Spilantini. Um, there we treated between month nine and 12. Um, at month nine, the dopamine release was down to about 30%. And uh, after month 12 with treatment, uh, so three months treatment, month 12, it was up to 60% or about two thirds or so, while the untreated went down to about 10%. So there's also a improvement. Um, there is no neuronal loss up until new, no, uh, month nine, but there is then neuronal loss in the untreated ones between nine and 12, while there's none between for the treated ones between nine and 12. So also there, um, um, it goes very well together, this phenotype um, together with the neuroprotection. Um, and then later also Maria Grazia Spinotini uh, did um, um, uh, very sensitive um, behavior um, experiments and could also show that um, there is a, a beneficial effect uh, of the under 38 b uh, for um, at month 12 and then even later uh, when they extended to month 20 when these effects were then also quite um, strong uh, to, uh, to be seen. So if you want to uh, look that up, this is this paper here um, um, uh, published in Acta Neuropathologica in 2019. <clears throat> I hope I have not forgotten anything. Thank you so much. Yeah, best wish to your clinical trial. Thank you very much. Is it correct to say that your small molecular compound um, pushes the on pathway oligomers to off pathway and becomes non toxic? Also, what does it do for fibers, the pre existing fibers? Uh, <clears throat> it binds to fibrils. Uh, and uh, so, so, I mean, for, for, uh, th that's, um, that's something that, that we are also um, um, studying. Um, <clears throat> it binds also to, uh, to oligomers. Um, in the end, uh, I mean, after enough time, um, it will um, disturb the equilibrium that um, is adopted in the absence of the molecule more towards um, monomer and oligomer than to fibrils. Um, um, but um, the, the question is, of course, about the kinetics, especially then in an animal where it's more relevant than, um, than in vitro. Um, in vitro, this takes, um, I mean, several hours or days or so, I mean, which is typical for the aggregation processes of, of, these, of these proteins. Um, in, um, in, um, in, vi in vivo, of course, there could be also on top um, um, quality control, uh, autophagy, lysosomal degradation, and, and stuff like that. And um, this we could not really totally disentangle uh, I would say so, so far. Um, okay, yeah. thank you. Sandrine, you can ask question directly. Sandrine, yeah. Yes, Go ahead. thanks a lot, uh, Christian and Leif. I have a question for Leif. I don't know if I say correctly your name, sorry. Leif. Leif. Uh, okay, sorry. So uh, according to your actual and recent knowledge, on the structuration of synuclein. Can we have a look? Uh, can we go back to your slide where you show the evolution of the intermediate of synuclein mm -hmm. in, in interaction with the membrane, which is really linked with the THT mm -hmm. uh, oh. curve? Uh, 
Uh, don't remember the name. Yes, maybe this one. Um, so, to your opinion, if we want to design uh, rational uh, inhibitors, which sequence has to be targeted? Um, that is definitely tough to say. Um, yes. I would I would agree um, um, at this. I would say at this stage. So, if if the the molecule has already reached intermediate one, that might already be too late. Um, so um, ideally, it, it might be even um, something prior to, inter uh, to intermediate one. Um, the reason for this is um, in our experiments, or in our hands at least, if we don't treat any, uh, these, these, uh, any further, the, inter uh, the conversion of intermediate one to intermediate two happens within an hour. Um, so uh, we are already very close to the, to the um, fibro um, when it comes to structure, um, there, there, uh, ev there's evidence that um, the hydrogen bonding network has not been fully developed, and there's um, uh, several structural features which are, which are very distinct from fibrils yet. But um, it might uh, might already be too late. If we can, of course, um, stop this uh, last step, uh, then of course, also fine. Um, might might be able to to uh, do so. Um, if we are not talking about inhibition, we are talking about uh, safeguarding the process, for example. Um, uh, and Professor Griesinger has shown that uh, the fibrils uh, can be a safe haven uh, for aggregation, um, being non-toxic or not as toxic at least as, as the oligomers. It might be good to target uh, these intermediates uh, if they have some uh, toxic uh, function. Uh, we have uh, 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 we have still to look into the specific mechanism when it comes to that, but I hope uh, I an answered your question. Yes, so maybe we should target the, the, the first, uh, so helical structures, maybe, rather, and the um, in terminal or maybe the, the middle? If that, if that, is, uh, if that is possible, um, pot potentially, I, I guess, I mean, um, there are many strategies to, to approach this pro uh, process. Um, the way I see it, um, on the uh, 130B probably um, protects from any toxic effects that aggregates have rather than, um, uh, or, well, and disassembling uh, uh, them. them uh, formation is still observed at, uh, to a certain extent, at least. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, Long Cheng. Go ahead, ask a question. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the exciting, very, this awesome presentation. So my question is, uh, that seems like uh, amazing this compound can uh, work uh, on the in vivo in different animal model for alpha synuclein tau. And uh, uh, I have two questions. One question is, do you think in vivo, the, indeed, the target for the compound is uh, only the membrane associated oligomer, or they have other targets. For example, the membrane free oligomers. Also, in the Lewy body, a lot of membrane is already dysfunctional. And uh, the second question is uh, considering the lessons we we'll learn from the antibody new immunotherapy for A beta, they can show very nice from behavior or pathology and uh, to show the treatment, but when they apply to human, uh, look like uh, uh, lost uh, the expected effects. So do you have any concern or strategy and for future clinical trial, do you will also facing this same issue? And the other thing, do you think this compound will work because for A beta, like an AD, the immunotherapy just specifically target on A beta. Well, for your compound that will target for on different, like A beta and tau, is that do you think that's your advantages of this compound for a powerful treatment or promising treatment? That's my question. Thank you. Okay, now I, I must admit that I forgot already the first part. But so, so first, question, uh, first question, do you think in vivo the real maxim is specifically the memory associated the algomer or they have a more broad... I am, yeah. So, yeah like no, let me first, uh, let me first yeah. start with the first one. Yeah. I mean, um, the, uh, the oligomers um, or the other the B will be, uh, will, will be very happy in, um, in, in, the, in the lipids. Um, the the um, aggregation um, 
or a lot of aggregation happens on the on the lipids. Yeah. Of course, it can also be that um, uh, that uh, there are um, hydrophobic molecules which take it out of the membrane. And uh, yeah. for example, we see when we add or live added BSA to our, uh, in vitro aggregation, yeah. and all that the kinetics of aggregation was was different. And um, so it can also be that um, that there's a distribution between this much more hydrophobic cytosol. Um, <laughs> Compared to if you just have a lipid um, and and a, um, and a buffer uh, buffer solution, so I think I'm not at all excluding excluding this. And I mean we have soluble variants of um, of the of the under 38B, which are similar to EGG yeah. and so on. And yeah. if we treat if we treat um, animals like flies or C. elegans mm. with these more soluble compounds, then there's also um, a very nice efficacy. So they. Mm. Of this problem with blood-brain barrier and stuff like that, and mm. so um, um, it looks as if one has activity in uh, for soluble. Um, I mean, for uh, um, looking at aggregates um, in solution mm. as well as in um, in on the membrane. I should mention also. I took that out from the presentation because um, it would have probably confused people that these soluble um, uh, small molecules also then inhibit four formation. So they have activity also regarding the membrane associated um, state um, and, uh, and in addition also on the, on the soluble state. Um, yet the soluble compounds never would make it to the brain. They, they are, um, have similar chemical properties like, uh, uh, like uh, EGCG and, um, and curcumin. Now, regarding the um, trial uh, co uh, construction with uh, Alzheimer and, and, and so on, of course, um, one has to look for, for, for as early as, as possible when there's um, still a lot of neuronal substrate um, around, because if that is gone, I mean, it's, not, a, it's not, not that new cells are formed or something like that. Um, so that, that will certainly be a concern. On the other hand, the aducanumab trial I think also paid a lot of attention uh, to that, and in principle, I mean, when if one looks at the at the data, mm -hmm. um, at, especially at the highest concentration of the antibody, um, then there is a slight improvement um, to be seen. So mm -hmm. it's not that um, the antibodies are totally um, um, ineffective, mm -hmm. uh, which actually, in my view, supports very much. Uh, the validity of aggregation as a target for um, neurodegenerative diseases. Mm. I think that um, there's too little um, amount there. And uh, also, um, even in the case of a beta, probably mm. also pretty active um, in the cell and an mm. may come inside the brain, but not necessarily then inside the cells. Uh, mm. Um, the damaging um, effect most probably occurs for a better, but for, for sure for tau, alpha-nucleine, and, uh, and IPP. Um, the other thing um, in Alzheimer's, uh, I think we are super happy that we have effect on a better and tau, because, I mean, yeah. in this splitting of the communities, um, one, the a better, yeah. uh, Aficionado saying it's a beta, the tau aficionado saying it's tau. So mm. we have a molecule which uh, which interacts with both. Uh, so I think um, this is um, super nice. And um, uh, if uh, a beta is more important than, than tau or vice versa, um, would not be super relevant for um, for the for the treatment effects we are observing. Actually, I have one more. The things you mentioned, the concentration cross the BBB, do you ever measure the concentration intracellular? That's given the clue this compound is working on the surface of the cell, or they can broadly work on different organelle membrane. Thank you. That's my last question. Thank you. Uh, well, I mean, now you know, we are asking for the distribution of uh, like uh, the the, the uh, can cross. Well, I mean, yeah. yeah, if yeah. you have a nice technique to measure that, um, <laughs> happy. <laughs> uh, uh, we we are uh, we are trying uh, with um, 
since long time uh, with nanosims, which is a method that has uh, nanometer resolution and therefore should be able to distinguish with cyt uh, between cytosol and, and, and membranes. Uh, there's a, a big difficulty to prepare um, it, it well because there are some embedding in polymers involved, which involves also organic molecules, which always wash away uh, all the other the DLP. So um, that's like a 10-year project already to really look at the subcellular distribution of under 38 b uh, and, and we cannot really tell. I mean, of course, you could say, why don't you put uh, fluorophore on it and stuff like that, but that would change the property so much that uh, we then see, uh, I mean, a fluorophore is bigger than this molecule, so we would put, probably just see the distribution of the fluorophore, but not so much of the under how about um, How about measuring, using NMR to measure the distribution of the compound? In lipid yeah, vesicles. I mean, that, of course, we, that we can do with um, with. And I'm saying simple lipid vesicles, and then see how much will stay in the. Solution. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that that we can do. I mean, we, uh, the distribution between a buffer and 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 lipid or so we, yeah. we know. That's yeah, that's a good idea, right? That is clear. I mean, the, the numbers, I think. No, no, so that, that that is clear. But in in the in the cell, I mean, for example, is it now how much is in the mitochondrial membrane? How much is in the inside? Uh, and so on. This this uh, this distribution we we don't have. I mean. We, maybe we should look at at extracts or so and um, and, and and do it in this way. But um, we have tried. Uh, we, we are we are aiming with this nanosims to try to find that out, and maybe that works. But it looks like your your, your uh, solubility for the small molecule is better in the in the um, greasy layer membrane, right? So yeah, yeah. would that mean that the compound is so when you when you have the compound distributed more in the greasy layer? Would it be effective to solubilize or uh, inhibit the uh, oligomers in solution as opposed to membrane? How effective they are? Um, um, I, um, the, 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 um, you mean now? So uh, let's say you have, a, you have a synuclein aggregating in solution phase and mm. in the membrane but your compound is more distributed in the membrane as opposed to in solution. So that means you can have oligomers forming in solution phase and fibers, et cetera, yeah. right? So, yeah. I mean, the, uh, at the moment, the hypothesis is that most of its uh, damaging effect, it does actually when it interacts with membranes. And uh, if that is correct, then it is not a problem that the molecule that tries then to whatever convert these oligomers uh, sits in the membrane. Uh, but the damage it, can be done by aggregating in the solution phase along with the membrane surface as well. Yeah, well, but I mean, um, <laughs> you, you see, I mean, for example, in the, in the yeah. BLM experiment there, we had oligomers prepared in solution. Yep. Then they were um, attaching to the membrane, they're making pores, and then the pores, however, were, were blocked after a certain amount of time. So this converting effect, at least on the electrophysiological level, uh, seems to happen uh, even if oligomers are preformed in solution and then then go there. So, uh, but of course, it's I think it's a it's one billion dollar question. Um, still, where does it this working? That's great. Yeah. yeah. And um, I mean, my, my view has been now more to also say, okay, let's look at how different um, mechanisms are affected in the presence or absence of this molecule because we, we know where it, are, uh, where it sits. So it could then actually uh, tell also mechanistically something, be it beneficial in the end to the humans or not, uh, but at least one can learn with it as a tool compound also. Absolutely. Absolutely. To see which mechanisms play maybe a bigger role and less role because mechanisms that are affected by the compound and then lead in an animal model to a beneficial effect could be important. Yeah. So how about, um, it seems to be, not, I don't know, selectivity of your compound towards the target protein seems to be active against a lot of amyloid proteins, A, beta, tau, and IAPP, and so on. That's great. But what about against functional amyloid proteins? Uh, um, well, uh, could you name one? <laughs> well, currently, and then we saw alpha helical proteins as well, and a lot of beta sheet uh, uh, functional proteins. Yeah, so uh, alpha helical um, seems not to be um, affected. Um, uh, I mean, um, for example, 
I, I think insulin also, uh, um, no, no, insulin is, is uh, blocked from aggregation, I think in, oh no, insulin blocks aggregation of, uh, of IAPP. Um, I mean, um, I, I don't know, we, we, we did not really check. Uh, we checked for um, uh, antimicrobial peptides, mm -hmm. uh, whether they are affected. Um, so I think it was alamethicin, and there we did not see any effect. Um, um, we have, uh, some time ago, we have looked at, um, at VDAC, uh, which is a beta barrel um, protein. Yeah. And there also, there was no um, effect from the um, under 38B. I mean, um, we have treated mice for, um, I think, up to 14 months. Uh, we have treated macaques up to uh, nine months. And um, there was, I mean, especially macaques are supervised very closely. So if one sees, oh, they are sleeping more, they are eating less, they are, I don't know what, um, they are less mob uh, mobile or something like that. We never ever observed any of these um, of of these effects. Um, I mean, there, there was also the question. Okay, um, for example, uh, we, we had a collaboration with Roland Winter, and he said, "Yeah, the membrane is stiffened uh, with the under 38B. Um, so that could then mean channels in the membranes suddenly change their behavior, or so. So maybe a mouse then gets a heart infarct or something like that." But um, nothing of that sort was, was observed. So it's very selective towards the synuclein channel only, is that right? So there seems to be um, some selectivity, which of course, um, if we have at some point in time more structural information, maybe we can rationalize. At this point, I, I can just say this is the observation. Okay. Uh, but I cannot explain it uh, on, a, on, a, on a structural basis. Um, uh, Are there any other questions from the panel? Magda, Joan, Bikash? I do have questions. Go Hi. ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so uh, I was uh, thinking, um, like, since your compound uh, can target so many oligomers, uh, do you have any ideas of what is the common places it, it will bind? <laughs> I know right. it's an impossible question. No, um, it's not an No, no. I mean, this. And, uh, and have you studied it for like HIAPP, uh, for example? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, this is now a um, project that several people in the in the group um, are working on. Life um, is the most advanced with uh, uh, with the with the alpha nuclein to try to find out where the molecule binds. Actually, there's also a question from an anonymous. Um, a person uh, does it bind to monomer? It doesn't bind. Uh, and what's the KD? Uh, we cannot really um, tell. We have a KD of the molecule in, in solution, but since it's very lipophilic, it just binds to everything. Um, there's about 200 nanomolar. Um, uh, but whether this is also the affinity in the membrane, um, I would not dare to um, uh, dare to say. So the look, um, um, we will have. I think very soon for some of these. Um, and then, of course, we uh, only then, uh, when we have it for a second and a third, we will be able to tell uh, why this potentially broad activity uh, or how this could be explained on a structural basis. At the moment, it's, it's just an observation. And um, of course, we are very, very eager to find out um, where the binding site is. And um, we have made, uh, especially by teaming out live with Vrinda and um, Loren and, and Risa, um, this, this team is producing the result, I think, quite soon. And um, so I, I hope to be able to tell, and, and they also will, ho I hope they will also be able to tell uh, pretty soon, at least for, for some of the amyloids where, uh, where these molecules bind, and then maybe also rationalize why it interferes with aggregation, which is also something, um, I mean, I, I listened once to a talk by Michael Gödert, and he, he showed the first um, uh, fiber structure of tau, and then Ulrich Hartl asked the question, so now, what does it tell you? 
and Michel Gödert was uh, silent for three seconds or so, and then he said, I have to confess, at the moment, not so much. Yeah, of course, I think only when you have more of these structures, you can relate them more to the, to the biology. Only then, I think you can, uh, you can draw conclusions. Um, presently, I think everything is kind of correlative and um, hopefully in a few years or so, hopefully before my retirement, <laughs> we will know more uh, about these, um, how this works actually. Yeah, that's, that's, that's. Um, hello, you have a question? Uh, Rams, can I ask one oh, more go ahead, question? Go ahead, Magda, sorry, go ahead. Um, have you tried your compounds on FUS uh, and TDP43, all these um, ALS related series? Uh, because here, like the way it's, you may be having a little bit of a sequences bits, uh, which may similarities among all these, which is active, but. Yeah, uh, we, we, we tried um, uh, a little bit sporadically. We, we, uh, we tried on FAS. Um, there's a guy in Münster who has a, um, a mouse model on this. And um, uh, I mean, it could be that this model is too aggressive or so, but there was no effect whatsoever. And um, TDP43, uh, we, I think we never really tried. Um, and um, I mean, there, there uh, I have the feeling that um, it, it could be a little bit different than, uh, than the other diseases because RNA is involved, there's uh, RNA processing um, involved and uh, um, uh, um, localization in, this, in, the, in the nucleus and in the cytosol. And I mean, in the same um, uh, series of talks uh, where um, Michel Goethe was presenting his first um, a tau structure, there was also uh, Greg Petsko uh, who had um, uh, um, uh, looked at this um, uh, nonsense uh, RNA processing pathway uh, and came up uh, with a protein that when he upregulated it, um, um, he could um, heal at least for certain mutants the fast related um, ALS. And um, so there, uh, it, it, it seems that um, the RNA processing uh, is maybe more relevant than the aggregation in itself, because despite the fact that he healed these mice, the aggregation was uninhibitedly going. Yeah? So he saw aggregates and, and so on. So um, it could be that these diseases are less related to aggregation than to more the um, downstream RNA processing, but this is very thin ice. And if somebody tells me I'm bullshitting, then <laughs> uh, uh, then um, I'm, I'm happy to hear um, uh, better stories. But um, at least this is the rationalization why FAS and TDP, um, uh, we don't see, um, well, a TDP we didn't check, but FAS uh, we, we checked um, and there was no effect. Magda, are you done? Yeah. yeah, I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Kamala, you are next. And then after that, Ratnish Lal. Kamala, go ahead. Hello? Kamala, go ahead. Hi, Hi Christian. Hi. Uh, I, I have a question for you. Um, very, very nice talk. Um, you show some NMR data about the interaction between uh, proteins and the phospholipids. You consider that this interaction occur in uh, on uh, the B layer on the surface B layer or in solution, considering the free lipids in solution. Okay, I, I was clear. I think this is probably more a question to life. Uh, at, at least it affects his part, but, uh, but we are sure that there's the interaction with the lipids. Uh, um, I mean, life showed, for example, these experiments in which he excited uh, water and then saw the transfer to the, to the uh, protein resonances. But then he also showed uh, the transfer to the um, 
uh, transfer to the uh, um, lipids, uh, the CH2 groups uh, of the lipid and the CH2 group of choline. Um, Life, please uh, go ahead. <laughs> Well, well, I mean, yeah, you, you said most of it. Um, uh, the, um, I mean, for the lipids that we use, the um, CMC is uh, very low. So uh, the amount of lipids that are uh, free lipids that uh, are in solution will be very, very low. And certainly they're too low to accommodate um, an unlevel 130B molecule. So um, we checked that a little bit and there's a an upper limit of uh, under 130 B uh, being able to incorporate it into lipids. So we need a certain amount of lipids to actually um, get under 130 B into solution. So um, I would not say that it uh, it is in solution. Also, given the strong affinity of all the aggregation relevant species, at least for alpha synuclein, towards phospholipids. So they all uh, strongly bind to lipids for fi fibrils. It is even tough to get rid of the, the lipids afterwards because they cling to fibrils so strongly. So I would say yes, definitely that it is um, uh, at the interface between lipid and water where we see the interaction of compound to protein. Okay, thanks. Uh, Ratnish Lal? You're thank, done. You very, thank you very much for me being part of system. I didn't even know till Christian reminded me last night that I have a seminar. And so, so now I, you become a, a permanent member of the seminar series. <laughs> so, I said, I'm trying, yeah. God, so. Uh, so, so, you know, I, you know I'm, in, I, I'm at seven o'clock, but I get up at six or five thirty, so it doesn't matter to me anyway. So it is really wonderful to listening to all of you and seeing your faces. It has been a year or two, who knows when. So my questions are very simple, you know. Um, uh, one is that uh, uh, you, you have the hydropathicity profiles, you know where, uh, where these uh, domains can get in the membrane. Uh, we had shown even in 1999, I believe, that either it's a monomer or oligomer, once they get into membrane, they both form ion channels. Um, and uh, since both monomer or preform oligomers form ion channel, uh, and you, you have the lipid binding domains. Do you, where do you think your compound is going to affect? The uh, point is that you, know, you can make mono, all small oligomers, but if you have monomers, they're already sitting. They can get in the membrane, they can form their own oligomeric channel. So where is your NLE138B going to bind or impact the uh, uh, toxic and, and channel, channel property? Well, um, uh, we uh, thank you for the question. Good to see you too, by the way. And um, the uh, we know we don't know so far. I mean, of course, we can look at a, a hydrophobicity map, and of course, uh, since the molecule is very hydrophobic, we expect it to bind to something that is very hydrophobic. Um, the the uh, the problem is, uh, for example, for for fibrils that um, actually the the hydrophobic parts get incorporated, so they're on the inside. They're not necessary, especially if you form them in the absence of lipids. They're they're on the inside, and um, also when when I think about um, the alpha synuclein aggregation, that is mainly dominated by lysine's interaction, uh, uh, lysine interaction with the negative um, membrane. And they will be the ones facing uh, facing the, the structure. So we could, for example, look at the sequence and look at anything that that neighbors a lysine and is hydrophobic. That would might be a naive way to go at this. And um, but hopefully, I mean, we're we're starting to learn more and more about these aggregates, and hopefully, we're we'll soon get a, a non-guessing. Uh, image of what this interaction uh, looks like. Um, uh, so far, uh, we we do not have a specific idea. There are a couple of sites that that uh, come into question. For example, aromatic re residues as well. Um, but uh, so far, uh, we cannot tell in detail. Right. Okay. No, because that leads to because Christian said that if you can figure out which oligomer is toxic and not toxic, you can get Nobel Prize. It means we are we are certainly out of the out of the range because if, <laughs> because if suppose if the monomer itself goes in the membrane and forms oligomers and forms spore that we have already shown 
long time ago when nobody used to believe it. It's a 1999 biochemistry paper that both of them form ion channels. So, so then if monomer forms ion channels, which is most likely can happen, they, they'll self-organize anyway. Every, every membrane spanning uh, protein, they leave it there in some membrane, they'll self-organize. This is a protein, protein, and lipid, lipid interaction, they, they separate. So we form from gap junction to name it everywhere, they're all the same thing. So, uh, so if the monomers can form, then uh, since you are blocked, if your if you're compound binds to, as you say that it binds to monomer anyway, so it might be even a more, more likely scenario might be that you're just not allowing them to get into the membrane. So that might be more effective. You know? So in that yes, case, that, that that is what uh, that is also uh, uh, one theory that that uh, just unle unle protects uh, membranes from from damage or, uh, by these species that is definitely that definitely a possibility absolutely and even the the the, the electrophysiology even would support that i would say um, mm -hmm. that an insertion of of these molecules or at least uh, it reduces the amount of, of uh, these species being inserted into the uh, membrane. So it might have a membrane protective effect. Yes. Although I, th I, th I, I think from the kinetics, I mean, because it takes some time, in the A-beta case, um, not so much, but in alpha nuclein and also in tau, of course, they are both bigger than, um, uh, than A-beta. Um, it takes some time. And um, my interpretation of that is that there must be some uh, rearrangement of the structure um, that uh, because um, diffusion of a small molecule in a lipid is so quick um, that it is uh, happen more or less instantaneously I mean on a, on a minute and not, but not on a minute time scale and so um, uh, I mean of course Radnesh we discussed that many many times uh, to see and try whether there are uh, macroscopic differences in these oligomers sitting in the membrane and we tried mm -hmm. with and we didn't see at least um, not at the resolution uh, of, of AFM and also not on the surface because AFM cannot look inside uh, we, did not, we did not see a difference um, but um, uh, I mean uh, we, we, we saw and I mean this was on a beta as well as on alpha nuclein that the um, attachment to at least to model membranes uh, in the presence or absence of unlearned to db was the same mm -hmm. uh, it's not uh, that it is kind of pushed away maybe it is um, i mean the just the binding is is not influenced too much maybe the insertion um, amount maybe the um, somewhere inside some some structural features are changed or so that that's that's still open and nobody really knows i mean i don't know Okay. Good. Uh, okay. Now I have a I have a I have a you know, information to Magdalena. She's talking about uh, ALS. You know that Magdalena that we have published in 2010, I believe, and there is one paper, two papers later on from by my ex postdoc and group at Chicago that SOD1 also forms ion channels, and SOD1 will be one of the best place to look for NLE 138P binding to see if it blocks. Toxic, any, any kind of toxicity and those things. So that that was done, you know, the, my exposed doc has a nice grants and all those things from Chicago, the Chicago group. That was before I left Chicago. So SOD1 does form ion channel, you know. Okay. Uh, but this, so I that, think um, Magdalena was uh, talking about FAS and TDP. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. But it's yes, the SOD. Uh, the SOD, I think, is more an agriculture right. than FAS and TDP. So, uh, or Hey, uh, uh, Lal, can you send us an email on that because we are going away from the topic because there are co more questions. Uh, no, Danny, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. And then uh, we'll go Long Cheng in the line. Thank you very much, Lal. Uh -huh. Danila, go ahead. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Hi, Chris. Nice to see you. Happy to see you and wholesome talk. Congrats. Uh, I have a question regarding the effects of these small compounds, possible effects of these small compounds in vivo. It is possible that potent aggregation, highly hydrophobic inhibitors, may also have an impact on protease activity. 
let's say IDE proteasome and other extracellular proteases that normally digest and remove excess amyloids, monomeric amyloids, however. This means probably that this double phase defect may turn off any beneficial therapeutic uh, opportunity. Have you planned to test these molecules for protease inhibition? There's a very simple test that can be routinely performed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have not, um, and I have no idea uh, whether um, there's any interference of proteases. Uh, we have done, um, I think, um, a kinase panel, um, and also we, we looked at uh, interaction with, um, with SIPs, um, but not with proteases. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, uh, it, of course, it could be, and um, uh, yeah, I mean, um, how would one do that? <laughs> <laughs> because normally when we perform THT assays, we don't have proteases, but normally in the cell there are proteases that work mm -hmm. together and okay. remove excess amyloids. So we have to take into account for these double phased effects, we can design potent inhibitors, but since as highly hydrophobic, it could stick on the active side of proteases and block their activity. So they don't do any more their normal function that is to remove excess monomeric amyloids. That's my... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I must say I, I cannot answer this question. Um, could well be. Uh, um, so far we have not seen too much inhibition of, um, of enzymes. Um, maybe also because the hydrophobicity of this molecule is pretty high and um, uh, protease targets, um, uh, targets for proteases are maybe not so, um, not, not so lipophilic, but this is now just speculation and I think uh, nothing would save us from doing that experiment. Okay, you know that we can do this, oh well, easy. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, thank so you. Much I, um, I will discuss with my um, with my colleagues and and see um, and 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 then contact you. Okay, we are waiting for you. <laughs> Bye. Okay, thank you. Because do you have any questions? Uh, I have a couple of questions. Go ahead. Go ahead. After yeah, that, have... after you, Long Chen. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. My first question is for life. Like very very nice results and good luck with your manuscript presentation. First of all, yeah. and my next question is for, for Professor Christian. So, okay. So start with for live, like uh, in, in your initial presentation, like you have shown that there are two different kind of polymorphic uh, fibers have been proposed for alpha semiclin, right? Yes. So in one case, like the end terminal is somehow protected and in other case, like your end terminal is somehow flexible, let's say, right? So uh -huh. in, in your, in your carbon 13, like DAR experiment, I could see that several like low population peaks are not assigned. So from that, is it possible to say that how homogeneous your fibers are or you expect both kind of polymorphic uh, fibers in your sample? Um, well, definitely. Well, um, there might be minor populations um, of, of something uh, that is, uh, uh, bears a different structure. But uh, usually from this, this, this NMR data, I would say that this is 5% uh, or lower. Um, whether or not that is polymorph one, then I, I cannot say. Um, uh, yes, there are a couple of, uh, so um, let's look at the DAR spect uh, spectra. Um, uh, DAR has a, uh, so they were acquired at a 3.2, with a 3.2 millimeter uh, rotor at a, at a 850 megahertz uh, magnet. And that allows us to get a lot of sensitivity so we detect even, even the tiniest of signals. A um, couple of these might also be noise. Um, but uh, when we want to do sequence assignment, we do uh, use proton detection and smaller rotors, which give less sensitivity, but higher resolution. And we, there we did not see enough to, um, to confidently say there's another polymorph or, uh, or an additional N-terminal part. So we did not ob uh, observe this in quanti uh, quantitative manner. That's what I would say. 
and and could you please provide like little details about the sample preparation like i would assume that like the you know, sample that you prepared for intermediate fiber and monomer yeah. they are frozen at a certain time right so you, they, you, you they they had uh, sorry so you froze the sample in different time point then you did the solid state nmr right yes so in that case like did you prepare the sample every time fresh or like this is the same sample and you are collecting one after another um well fibrils are uh, stable for a long time we can um at 4 degrees in a in a fridge we can store them for a long time if, especially if they're packed into a rotor where nothing can enter or exit um for intermediates we do need to uh, prepare them freshly every time because no no, no uh, i i i understand that i wanted to know that when you start preparing your sample yes. so the initial peptide was constant or you prepare the sample like different days so that is what i wanted to know yeah yes we do need to do that so uh -huh. otherwise we wouldn't get enough of one sample um so i the yield is not too exciting for intermediates because they are uh, even even in our preparation there are lowly pop populated species so we do do need to prepare a, a fresh batch every time yes and mm -hmm. and it, it it is a very laborious and very uh, nerve wracking process and therefore it is enough to prepare one sample one day yes. yeah i understand that yeah, yeah. yeah thanks for that clarification yeah Okay. And my next question is for Professor Christie. And actually, uh, I know about this small compound long back when I interact with you after like this for one year, and you are already entered to the clinical trial, right? So I was just wondering, like these kind of hydrophobic compounds. I think uh, Professor Danilo also mentioned a very important point regarding the IDE activity or any kind of protease activity. So I'm wondering, like, uh, do you know, like, how specific these compounds are? Like, because we know that it can cross the blood-brain barrier and can target A beta, alpha synuclein, and many kind of disorder proteins, right? My question mm -hmm. is that once it cross the blood-brain barrier, so what is your bet? Like, uh, how can you claim that it can go and it can reach to the IDPs rather than going to any kind of structure proteins? For example, let's say your GPCR proteins or any kind of soluble proteases, or let's say you can say some kind of neuropeptides. So there are so many things in the brain. Like, uh, like what is your rationale that this compound can actually target the IDPs rather than targeting any other proteins? Um. um... Yeah, I I I cannot um, tell now. Of course, for the I think the brain makes thirty thousand proteins or so. We did not check uh, how it interacts with all these thirty thousand proteins. But for example, what I can say, I mean, when when we submitted the first paper, um, then people asked, so what about functional um, aggregates like actin and tubulin? So is the um, aggregation um, uh, dynamics affected by this? Um, Uh, by by this molecule as well, so we tested that, and in the case of actin, there was no effect. In the case of tubulin, there was actually even um, a slight enhancement um, effect uh, by by this molecule. Um, so, um, but I, I must say, I mean, like uh, Danilo's uh, question, I, I I mean, I cannot tell now with the thirty <laughs> thousand minus uh, two <laughs> other proteins uh, how the activity is. Um, uh, yeah, I I cannot tell. I mean, as I I think I mentioned kinase and uh, sub. Uh, we looked at, um, and there was um, no kind of disturbing problem. I mean, if you drink coffee, for example, I mean, coffee interacts with GPCRs as well. Yeah, I mean, the A 2 A receptor is totally blocked. Yeah. Uh, the A 2 A GPCR is totally blocked, and Nobody cares. Yeah. Yeah, like in terms of a drug, I I was wondering like if uh, like any kind of information that uh, you can provide us maybe in future, like how much binding. Like I know you mentioned that it binds to the monomer like 200 nanomolar. No, no, no. I say I say to um, to aggregates um, in the absence of lipids. Yeah, uh, yeah, to, yeah. So the binding ability is around in nanomolar range, right? Yeah, to monomer we could not see uh, binding. Yeah, so like I was wondering, like for example, SOD, like we are talking about ALS also, Magdalena, like see, uh, like uh, if you can like provide any kind of information in future, like how specific this compound in terms of their binding affinity to these kind of aggregates and SOD, let's say soluble SOD, that will be really helpful to understand how specific mm -hmm. these compounds are. Yeah, I mean, um, as I mentioned, we could measure the uh, affinity to. Um, 
to a better tau uh, um, aggregates and alpha nuclein in solution. Yeah. Uh, but there, um, I mean, th but this is, I mean, what, what does this affinity then really tell you? Because uh, most of it is anyway um, in lipids or attached to, to very hydrophobic uh, proteins. So it's more the question of a partition coefficient uh, right. between uh, this kind of matrix of cytosolic uh, proteins and um, and uh, um, and and then the and then the target protein. For example, I mean, um, um, w when one characterizes uh, small molecules, there's a lot of times the question: how much is free in the blood and how much is bound to human serum albumin? And I think this was determined in our case: 99.9 percent .9 is bound to the serum albumin. Yeah. So, uh, and this is clear. It's Solubility is so low, but uh, we reach uh, concentrations in the 10 micromolar or so, which is 50 times uh, over the uh, concentration um, in, in solution. So it must be that it goes to something that is in the, uh, that, that is there, like human cell albumin, uh, maybe some lipids also where it binds to, um, and so on. So the question really is, um, what KD you do you want to know? <laughs> yeah. okay. um, and uh, it seems that it likes more these aggregating um, proteins uh, that have some structural features which we are after that are probably common than to other stuff where it could also bind to which is just um, has some hydrophobic patches or so. I mean, human serum albumin it binds to. Yeah, we can. Uh, I think if one puts 100 micromolar serum albumin in a solution, uh, one can add uh, at least 100 micromolar also of uh, of, of under 38 B. It is just just binds there. Yeah, uh, but it also then apparently comes off again. Yeah, and uh, um, and so it's I mean it's everywhere also. I mean um, Ratnish says I mean it's not good if it's everywhere, but um, uh, I mean, given also that all these diseases actually are everywhere, yeah, I mean, uh, Parkinson's disease is in the gut, in the nose, uh, on, the, on the pathway uh, to, to there. So in principle, my view is actually good that it is everywhere. Yeah? Uh, um, but of course, uh, one has, I, I, I really th think one has to see how in the end um, it will be then in a, in a clinical trial. Uh, um, now that it is very probable that uh, we will be able to do that, um, I mean, then one can check how well also do animal models reproduce what one sees uh, about the human disease. And um, in principle, that's also a very open question. How translatable are the, the mouse models to the human disease? Nobody can tell. Yeah, in principle, a clinical trial can, can um, only a clinical trial will eventually give the answer. Okay, so thank you very much. Can we take one more, one last question? Uh, Long Cheng, go ahead. I really appreciate it for the last question. So my question is during disease at early is this protein undergoes PTM, like which is uh, for example for collation and uh, ubiquitination, which can really change the charge or hydrophobic property. And some uh, modification is cleavage they can remove the N-terminal and the C-terminal. That means can potentially remove the, some like a bonding side to the membrane or a compound. So my question is, uh, do you ever consider and uh, for your compound screening or your modeling uh, in the future ever to using any modified with different modified forms of alpha synuclein or other protein to do the, uh, to, uh, whether which can cause a different uh, Result or outcome? Yeah, that's my question. Um, I had some problems understanding acoustically. Um, I, I got that you would like to know whether we are looking at modified alpha nuclein in order co compare then with no nuclein. Is that the question? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, 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 so far, we have. Well, I mean, in, in principle, in most of, I mean, in some of the models, for example, there were these, uh, these human um, uh, mutants, A30P. Um, we looked also uh, uh, once at um, um, 
uh, now what's this, A53T uh, mutant. Um, so there, there we looked at family mutants. Um, but in most cases, actually, we looked um, at, uh, at wild type absolutely in either overexpression or seeding models. In the case of a beta, it's also, um, and tau, it's always the, the human one, or this mutation, um, what was it, um, a serine mutation, I think, now I forget, uh, Pauline. A53. Yeah, but, yeah. but most of the time, uh, we, we try to be as close to the human sporadic situation as possible. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's, can we take a look at the Q&A folder to make sure that we answered all the questions? It looks like life and uh, Christian, can you take a look at the question? Oh, there, there was one question which I typed an answer to. I can also... Um, so one question briefly. from anonymous attendee was, uh, does the compound bind to monomers nuclein? You already answered it. Mm -hmm. What is the KD? Uh, where does it bind? I think we already discussed this. And then there was a question about lipid binding to fibers. Maybe you answered already, right? Um, yeah, I typed an answer in the in the chat, but uh, just in case, I can also um, talk yeah. about this briefly. Um, yeah. It was about the HH and H experiments, and right. the question was whether or not fibrils are incorporated into the fibril. Yeah. And I, I can see where this this uh, assumption might um, might come from is that we have a couple of residues here shown in the uh, uh, in the inside of the fibril which show interaction with lipids. I was astounded myself that we see this. For these two, um, uh, it, my, uh, there is a certain ambiguity, but I, uh, I, I label them regardless. Um, but other than that, for all of these, this is uh, this is interaction to the backbone. Uh, mm -hmm. This is not the this. Uh, so I I show here uh, the surface diagram, but it's actually the backbone which we're measuring. So if we look, for example, here at at this residue or um, this valine here, they're all the they're the a side chain is facing the inside and it's actually the backbone which is, is exposed so i i do not think that it's uh, it, get, it gets incorporated what might be happening is that certain vesicles rupture and cover the whole whole uh, lip uh, fibril surface and therefore um, lipid gets very close to uh, to um uh, the, the 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 this part but um i do not think they get internalized also um uh what i want to say is uh, yeah the, we do not exactly know the uh, contribution from the end fibril ends so it might also be that the ends of the fibril um contribute uh, contribute a minor amount to the signal that we detect thank you thank you very much and thank you both for a great uh, talk and um, real lengthy q and a session there's still one more question is there we'll continue on that if you're available for a few minutes so thanks to the participants for a lively participation and we do have Zoominar next week. So we'll see you then. Um, Christian and Life, you can hold on for a few minutes. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I want to thank you, Christian and Life, so much for joining the seminar. It was a wonderful discussion. Uh, and uh, Brahms, I'm going to leave right now. But uh, thank well, you so much for seeing Bindu, you. Can you ask a question? Uh, we are now informal about Go ahead. Bindu. Sorry? Binzu, you yes. are. Uh, should be able yes. to ask question directly. Yeah, uh, I have a question about the compound for Dr. Greensinger. So this uh, compound NL, NL138B, which is a diphenyl pyrosol compound, mm -hmm. how do you discover it? Uh, is it from a library screen of like a very diverse uh, small molecule library or you design it through like an analogs or functional group you already know you know, have the potential of uh, amyloid inhibition? Well, I mean, and uh, it, it was, uh, as I mentioned, um, um, Armin Giese made a screen with about 20,000 compounds and found three scaffolds out of which pyrazole, diphenylpyrazole was one. And then, um, I mean, the, the two um, mentioned uh, chemists, Andrei Leonov and Sergei Razanov, started synthesizing blindly because we did not have any structural information. Um, and the, the compounds that were found were um, pretty hydrophilic, so they had OH groups and so on, similar to the uh, to the um, uh, to, uh, to EGCG and 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 so on. And then Andrei Leonov and um, Anle actually are the 
first initials of his first name and the first letters of his first name and of his uh, and of his second name. So the 138th compound that he made, then he incorporated the, the fact that um, actually ecstasy makes it very nicely to the brain. Um, and if one looks at ecstasy, it's a, a modification of dopamine um, exactly in the way uh, with a um, formal formaldehyde um, um, uh, uh, condensed uh, with two OH groups. And so um, with, this, um, uh, with this modification then, first of all, it became more lip lipophilic. Second, um, it became more, um, um, it be became not oxidation dependent anymore because I mean, there's the theory of antioxidation versus um, aggregation inhibition or so, these molecules cannot be oxidized um, anymore unless one, I mean, really uh, bumps them <laughs> in, uh, and, and, and so on. So, so it, in principle, it was a blind screen. It was some uh, medicinal chemical intuition, uh, which um, Andre and Sege developed uh, over the time. I mean, they started modifying this molecule in 2006. Two years later, we had the under 38 b And since then, we are finding more molecules. I mean, there's not only aggregation in, um, in neurodegeneration, but also in many other biological systems. Um, so that's also something we are um, pushing. And um, I mean, uh, it's, it's quite interesting. And maybe at some point in time, when we have more insight there, I could give a seminar on, on, on many other deleterious uh, aggregation processes taking place in totally different realms uh, of, of biology. Um, and it's then interesting to see that, again, these uh, compounds interfere, but the specificity is then a different one. So um, one really needs then others to have uh, full, uh, full activity. Um, um, so this is, in a way, a gold mine <laughs> for in chemical space, as well as in um, biological importance. Uh, and, and, and so it's quite exciting um, that beyond aggregation and neurodegeneration, there's also more uh, to, to, to discover. And um, could well be that uh, it is, um, I mean, it's very much estimated or appreciated in neurodegeneration that aggregation plays a role. But in other um, biological events, um, it's still not so much in the focus of, uh, of people. And um, maybe um, it's, it's, it's a mistake. Uh, and and uh, we are working with um, biologists on other um, systems there. And it looks, um, I mean, super exciting. This Very is exciting really story. We certainly look forward to your more talk, you know, about how to discover <laughs> new molecules, uh, as you okay. mentioned. Yeah. One, one point you mentioned, which I think is very interesting about oxidation. How, why do you want to avoid that? Is there any reason? You said avoid those compounds, you, you want to avoid those uh, can be oxidized. Ah. Well, I mean, if it's oxidized, um, uh, um, I mean, first of all, it's a question of mechanisms. But the, but the other thing is, of course, if it's oxidized, then uh, most of the time um, it's, uh, it becomes more lipophilic, uh, more hydrophilic, and then um, the concentration goes down. And met metab I mean, you, you would like to have um, metabolism to be slow enough uh, that the actual active molecule is there for some time. And uh, that's, that's why, um, in principle, any metabolism, but including oxidation, uh, is, um, would be nice to, to uh, at least delay for a certain amount of time. That's true. And like one thing is like about one molecule is like a dopamine you mentioned. So dopamine can actually can be oxidized. And dopamine is also, dopamine analog has been used for treatment uh, for uh, Parkinson's. Absolutely. So I just, well, of course, we don't want any, any compound which is not stable. So I, I guess uh, this is a very interesting point, you know, have to be carefully considered. Thank I, you. In principle, it's true for any drug. I mean, of course, you have the products which have to be metabolized in order to release the drug. But normally, you would like to have um, uh, a, a drug be stable 
for for a few hours. I mean, if the, if the half life is whatever a minute or so, you would have, and you need the drug, then you would have to apply it all the time. So in order to avoid that, you have to apply it um, every hour or something like that. You need to have some metabolic stability. Well, Christian looks like a lucky molecule, molecule of the year, maybe. Maybe you should try <laughs> for anti-cancer activity and then see antibiotic uh, activities as well. Because it's blocking the channel, maybe outer membrane protein can be you know, modified so that the existing drugs can be reused. Well, I mean, uh, you, you're, mentioning, you're mentioning now cancer. I mean, we have a publication in cancer. Uh, so that's what one. Is molecule? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, so what can you tell us? If, are you not, I, I can. Tell us. <laughs> I, I can send you. I mean, this is a very nice uh, collaboration with. I mean, most of the time, I mean, I, I have no idea about biology. So normally, I have to happen to meet somebody who has insight into into a certain biological mechanism, and then uh, it comes out there's aggregation involved. Then we say, okay, we have something that uh, inhibits aggregation. Let's see whether it works. And so, in, in melanoma, for example. Uh, through a co collaboration with a former professor at Pittsburgh University, Dorothea Becker, we found out that um, if one interferes with alpha nuclein aggregation, then uh, uh, melanoma cells are affected by that and are killed. And uh, uh, so, so, but this seems to be very specific for, for melanoma because their alpha nuclein is overexpressed um, and uh, um, and it's not so many other cancers have this overexpression, but they may express other proteins. And uh, so that's certainly one of the, um, of the applications. And you mentioned bacteria. Indeed, uh, that's, that's another um, realm where um, aggregation uh, plays a big role. Well, not only that, you can also block the channel to see if it can, the pumping out mechanism can be blocked. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. So thank you very much for both of your patience and uh, detailed answers. So because now if you want to ask questions, depending on their time, it's all yours. So if you can ask questions. So <laughs> I think no, I am good. I think Long Cheng wanted to ask something. So we can allow him if he wants to ask one. Long Cheng, I, he did ask, right? No, he wanted to ask one more question. I don't know. So I have another technical question to life. And if you... So the idea is to go faster and faster spinning. Um, I'm not sure if you're using 0 0.7 millimeter rotor. Yes, we are. Um, let's say we are using the 0 0.7 millimeter rotor for membrane sample. Mm -hmm. What is the concentration of the pep protein that you can get inside the rotor along with the lipids? Um, uh, I am I'm like not... a whole microliter volume. Yeah, I um, it's it's not a lot that I can tell it's you. Not uh, a lot. I, I, no, I don't want to name name. What I'm is the sorry? molar ratio of the protein to lipids? Um, it's it's uh, five to one, so five lipids uh, uh, on one uh, protein molecule, but that is a molar ratio. So, so yeah. can get um, I think I think Lauren wants to comment on that. Um, <laughs> he raised yes. his hand. Maybe we allow yes. him to <laughs> enter. <laughs> there's there's the expert answer which I uh, I was looking for. Who so let, I let him in? Yeah, I think he can speak. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, hi, Raman Murthy. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Lauren. How are you doing? Yeah. Great. Thanks. I've been listening to this fantastic discussion. Yeah. Um, so here's something that's that I can I can give some numbers. So it's it's around 300 nanoliters or so the active volume. Correct. Um, and what we see so is 300 that, nanoliters um, for the 0.7 millimeter rotor, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm. I mean, you can um, you can fill it to about 500, but the active volume, meaning really inside the coil, is more like right. 300. And uh, what we see is that if you if you follow the physics, you expect around a factor of two loss in signal compared to the 1.3s. Yep. Uh, because you also, of course, gain um, linearly with the the diameter. Um, this micro coil then has a better pickup of the um, magnetic moment. Um, so so. We, Basically, what we see is with the with the uh, latest Bruker probes that it follows pretty much that uh, that trend. Um, yeah. That being said, for this project in particular, we're dealing with uh, fully protonated samples most of the time, um, and in that case, we see a, pro a line narrowing in the proton, which in some cases can be close to a factor of two, meaning that we get back around uh, the same sensitivity. So, 
The real challenge that we have with those rotors is, is a very simple technical one. It's, it's just incredibly difficult to handle those rotors, as I'm sure you know uh, from, from working with similar systems. Yeah, we tried uh, for nanodis, Bikash tried for nanodis sample, so it's very frustrating. We get all the time noise for free. <laughs> Bikash, think, uh, you can share your experience. He, he says yeah, that- like We what, didn't see much pics. It, it looks like yeah. uh, the lipid is actually consuming most part of the rotor and your peptide is like really less. So I wonder that if we can, as I told Bikash, like we can mix with the lipids and then somehow prepare the oligomer or fiber, whatever it is, and then try to remove the lipids so that we can put more protein sample in the rotor. I don't know how to do that without disturbing the intermediate structure. So in case of light, like for the monomer, like do you know how much MIG is going inside your rotor, like the smallest rotor? Um, how much, um, okay. Um, for uh, the smallest rotor, I, I cannot say. I mean, for, for the monomer, we only, only use 3.2 rotors. Um, uh, but but regarding the uh, removal of lipids, uh, we have actually tried that um, uh, for um, and the we used uh, so uh, on Lauren's advice we used phospholip uh, phospholipase um, two uh, from bee venom and we tried treating the fibrils with it and I could not see a major difference. So there's, um, there does not seem to be a lot of lipid removed. So I, I detect a little bit of uh, lipid that, that is removed, but other than that, uh, there doesn't seem to be a, a large effect. And that might be specific to the system. Uh, it might Correct. be different yeah. For, yeah. For, other, for other proteins, which might not cling to lipids as strongly as the fibrils. Please, one should try to spin it down to see if we can remove um, only take the sedimentation and then pack it in the rotor. That may be more efficient. I don't know. One has to try it out. But but that that is exactly the problem for for these amyloid aggregates. They right. they pull down the lipids. Then right. you have a uh, you have a you have a pellet that is made up of protein and lipids. So and lipids. yeah, um, that is also not not possible. Sadly. Yeah. So we tried uh, fibrils in the smallest rotor. The 0.7, uh -huh. but, uh, but we haven't tried oligomers because we get about, you know, in a good case. Oh. There he was gone. No, no, he's there. He's there. Oh. Ah. Um, then I can start my video. I was just preparing dinner. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> dinner in the, in the nice background. That's great. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, in the good case, the, the intermediates last around three weeks or so. And so that's just uh, really challenging with the, the cost of these 0.7 rotors and the challenge to pack them. It also takes a few hours to pack them. So yeah, it's killer. Um, it's, it's really tough, yeah. Very, most of the time we break the, the, the wheels, the tips actually, so. Yeah, for the 0 0.7 mm rotor, like, do you remember how long uh, you took to like acquire this kind of spectra? It is like five days or more than that. Um, go ahead. For, I, I, so that, that was uh, regarding our spectra? Yeah, yeah, the spectrum that you showed today, do you remember like how long you uh, took to acquire this kind of like resolution? Oh, uh, the, so what, which, Spectrum? Are you talking about the the dark spectrum yeah, or the, the intermediates? Spectrum. Yeah, the dark spectrum. Yeah, that is that is three days. Three days in 850 megahertz, right? Yes. Okay. And uh, and it basically well the the and the ca caveat is also that it, that that you need to wait at least one and a half to two days to get enough signal to even know whether you right. succeeded in the preparation. Right. right. So that is three days minimum of measurement time that you need uh, to to get signals uh, above noise. So, uh, in nutshell, we need Max Planck everywhere to have <laughs> one gigahertz and 1.2, and then lots of MAS rotors. <laughs> yeah, I mean, especially for the proton detection. Uh, I mean, yeah. as you know, the instead of increasing the spinning frequency, we can also increase the field to help with the resolution yeah. there right. and get uh, a better than linear improvement there. So, we're looking forward to. The, we don't have a 1.3 millimeter probe there yet. Um, but we're looking forward to when that comes. So Long Cheng, you had a question? Long Cheng? Okay, he's not there, it looks like. 
All right, so we are done. So thank you all very much uh, for coming and enlightening us in in the very short notice. Really, really appreciating very much for your help and uh, great thanks for having us. Thank yeah. you. Life thank and you luck and congratulations on this magic molecule. <laughs> maybe, thank maybe, you. maybe sprinkle it over a beer and sandwich and then have it. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a. <laughs>